Here we are, Colossians chapter 4. I'm going to take you through verses 7 through 11 today as we continue as we have through the book of Colossians. And so we've arrived here in chapter 4, and I'll read verse 7, read to verse uh, 11, and we'll get into our study. Uh, Colossians chapter 4, beginning at verse 7. Now, the way this name is pronounced is Tychicus, but I usually say Tychicus, so let's see what happens here. We'll just call him Bill. A beloved brother, faithful minister, and fellow servant in the Lord will tell you all the news about me. I am sending him to you for this very purpose, that he may know your circumstances and comfort your hearts. With Onesimus, a faithful and beloved brother who is one of you, they will make known to you all things which are happening here. Aristarchus, my fellow prisoner, greets you with Mark, the cousin of Barnabas, about whom you received instructions. If he comes to you, welcome him. And Jesus, who is called Justus, these are my only fellow workers for the kingdom of God who are of the circumcision. They have proved to be a comfort to me. And so Paul is closing his, his letter. And as he does so, he makes mention of several people that the Colossians would know. He mentions 11 people. He also mentions churches. He mentions the church in Laodicea as well as the church in Hierapolis. Now, when you look at a map, both Laodicea and Hierapolis were within 12 miles or so of uh, the church there, the city of Colossae. So as we begin, I want to share some things, fundamental things, some foundational things. And I'd like to point something out that is very obvious, but it's so obvious it might be missed. I want you to think about how Paul mentions so many people by name. He speaks of Tychicus, Onesimus, Aristarchus. He speaks of Mark and Barnabas and Justus. He speaks of Epaphras, Luke, Demas, Nymphus, and Archippus. So why is that worth noting? Why is that something significant? It's significant because it reveals something about what the church actually is. See, we're living in a time where people speak about going to church. They, they think of church as being a building. And so they belong to the church. They go to the church. They think of it as a denomination. But the church was designed differently than that. The church is designed to be a community. The church, the body of Christ, Believers are actually a community that God has brought together through the power of the Holy Spirit. It isn't some place that we just go. It's not the building. Because some people will go to church. They'll say, well, I'm going to church. And, and in, in a way, I mean, that's, that's proper to say. Of course, we know what you mean by that. You're going to go to a church uh, uh, facility and you're going to attend church services. I'm not saying that's a bad thing. What I'm saying is, is sometimes that, that doesn't give to us the full understanding of what a church is. A church isn't just a building. A church isn't just a place that we go to meet. A church isn't a denomination. A church is more than that. A church is a community. It's a community of believers in Jesus Christ. In 1 Corinthians 12, verses 12 and 13, Paul said, As the body is one and has many members, but all the members of that one body, being many, are one body, so also is Christ. For by one Spirit we were all baptized into one body, whether Jews or Greeks, whether slaves or free, and have all been made to drink into one spirit. There's one body. We are that one body, the community of believers in Jesus Christ. When I first was saved, that idea was, was really new to me. The idea of, of being the church was very new to me, and the idea of, of needing other people was also a new concept. I was very self-sufficient like everybody else. But I later began to learn that fellowship is essential if I'm going to mature in Jesus Christ. And, and I had to come to understand that the church is a living organism that's been designed by God to work together. So with this in mind, I find it instructive that Paul would be able to mention so many people by name. This is not the only place Paul mentions church members by name. If you read the book of Romans and you conclude at chapter 16, Romans 16 records 27 people by name. 1 Corinthians chapter 16 mentions eight people by name. 2 Timothy chapter 4 mentions 11. Titus chapter 3 mentions 4. And Philemon mentions 6. All 
by name. Paul got to know these people, and people knew these people, and that's because they were serving alongside of him. God designed us to serve. God designed us to work together, to fellowship with other people. In Ephesians 4.16, it says, From whom the whole body joined and knit together by what every joint supplies according to the effective working by which every part does its share causes growth of the body for the edifying of itself in love. The body of Christ was designed to work within itself, amongst itself, to do the works of ministry. And as you begin to serve with other people, as you begin to serve the Lord and you do so in your fellowship, we'll say, that's an opportunity for you to begin to know people by name, to know who they are, to know things about them, to have relationship with them. If there's anything that we are today in society, it's amazing how many opportunities we have to gain information through the various media sources we have and all of that, the Facebook, Instagram, and all the other things that people use. There's still a very, very great amount of lonely people, and many of those lonely people are, are also church attendees. We don't really get to know one another. We know things about each other or things that are said on Instagram or whatever, but we really don't know one another. And the, one of the ways and the most basic and easiest way to get to know somebody is to, in church, is to serve alongside of them. And Paul knew these people. Many years ago, I was an assisting pastor in another fellowship, Calvary Chapel in Claremont. And part of my ministry duties at that time uh, included working in the nursery. What a joy. And, um, and, and Marie and I, my wife and I, would work in the nursery and we'd serve on Sunday. We had a uh, rotating basis and all. We'd serve there on Sunday. And, and there was a little boy inside the uh, nursery was be, we cared for. He was, uh, I, I'd say, around a year or less. And uh, his name was Adam. And uh, Adam's, uh, Adam was one of these kids that he didn't go with anybody, but he would come to me. And I think part of it is because I had a beard and glasses, and his dad had a beard and glasses. And, and I think he just kind of like um, you know, came to me because he felt comfortable. And so I would hold him. I'd hold him the whole you know, hour and a half church service, and he would cling to me, and I couldn't put him down. And my son David's a few months younger than he. And my son David was a you know, crawling baby at that time, and he would crawl up, and he would grab my, my leg and hold on to me and look up at Adam. He already hated Adam, <laughs> you know, because Adam was taking my time and my attention from little David. And, but with that, I got to know Adam's dad and mom. And as I got to know uh, Dan and Debbie, um, eventually, and they came through serving in a simple way, they became dear to us, as a matter of fact, when I went to begin this church, Dan uh, came along with me, and he was my first assistant. And, and it, started, it started in a nursery. It started by taking care of somebody's child. And that connected us and caused us to have opportunity to know each other, which ultimately led to the place where, where Dan and, and Debbie were part of our fellowship. They were here the second week that we began our church, and, and were, remained with us for for some time until he went off and planted his own church. And it's a blessing, even as I'm saying it, to say that they're sitting right here in, in front of me right now. You know, and I've been worried about them because I know they're backsliders, and it's good to see them. You know, and so that's how it works. You know, you never realize how God will connect hearts. And he wants to. He wants to. He wants you to have relationship. He wants you to know people and to be known by them and and it isn't good that a man should be alone even as you know and for us i i feel what happens with men very often is as a young man we have we have our, our whole our whole upbringing uh, most of us not all but many of us if not if not almost all we we have adventures that we had as kids and it was always with you know with our buddies you know we we had groups of guys we hung around with and and for me that was true you know, from things like just neighborhood friends, you know, and to, to sports and, and ultimately into the military. I always had buddies. We always had friendships, you know. We, we, we would take a long drive at night and we, we'd go somewhere and stop at some diner on the side of the road at four in the morning and have some coffee and talk and speak and share and open up. And that was my life. That's, that's what we did. We had relationship, and it was with guys. And then we, we, we get a girlfriend, and we fall in love with her. We get married to her. 
And for a guy, a lot of times, he stops having buddies anymore. He, he now has his wife. He, he has his job. He has his family. Now, the wife, on the other hand, she has us, but she has her friends too. And she has relationships with her friends because women have that social uh, ability, whereas men, we have a tendency of kind of like limiting those things to certain things. And, and what happens is we become lonely as men. We don't have friendships anymore. We don't have relationship anymore. We don't have anybody to bear our soul to anymore. We don't have anybody that we talk to. We don't confess our faults one to another. We don't have any of that. We kind of like just keep those things to ourselves, and we become kind of alone. Where the wives, well, they're entirely different. Men and women, we know that there's such a difference. I mean, we know that. And the, and the social scientists are trying to say, no, men and women are the same. That's not true at all. Just go to a restaurant and sit there. And, you, and your wife says to one of the girls there, I'm going to the bathroom. You want to come? And, and off you go in a parade. I mean, three or four women, off they go to the bathroom. Well, what would happen if I said that? I'm there and my buddies are there. Hey, man, I'm going to the head. You want to go? I, I, it doesn't work. It doesn't work. I mean, yeah, women will speak to one another, you know, through the stalls. They'll be in the stall. They'll say, hey, nice shoes. Men don't do that. Men don't do that. We walk into the bathroom and we stop talking. Even if you've got a best friend you're walking and talking to. If there's some, another guy or two guys in there, do you guys keep talking? No. I usually get kind of quiet and take care of business, come out, and then we continue our conversation, not women. We're entirely different. And we have to begin to be aware of those differences. And one of the ways that we can actually have relationship is in our service to God. How did Paul know all these people? He knew them because they worked alongside of him. He knew them by name, and he called them out by name, and he would speak to them because they cared about him. He, they cared about him, and he cared about them. And that's what we're looking at here when he begins to name these people, Tychicus, verse 7, a beloved brother, a faithful minister, a fellow servant in the Lord, will tell you all the news about me. So he begins with Tychicus. Now, he's mentioned various other times in the New Testament. We know that he's a Gentile believer. We know he's from the province of Asia. And he traveled with Paul, according to Acts chapter 20. We know that he often served as a messenger for the Apostle Paul because you see him in that regard in Ephesians 6, 2 Timothy 4, as well as Titus chapter 3. Here he is identified as a beloved brother, a faithful minister, and notice a fellow servant. Now, <laughs> Paul described him in a similar way to the Ephesians. In Ephesians chapter 6, verses 21 and 22, this is what he writes. He says that you that you also may know my affairs and how I'm doing, Tychicus, a beloved brother and faithful minister in the Lord, will make all things known to you, whom I have sent to you for this very purpose, that you may know our affairs and that he may comfort your hearts. So notice he recommends Tychicus to them. He ensures that they can trust him. And look, notice how he is, he is described. He's a beloved brother, a faithful minister, and a fellow servant in the Lord. First, he is a beloved brother. He was a Christian. He became a Christian because he heard the gospel. He heard the gospel of Jesus Christ, a gospel that called him to salvation, a gospel that spoke concerning his separation from God due to his sin, a gospel that spoke of the grace of God in sending a son, to take upon himself the sins that Tychicus had. And he heard that message, and he believed that message. He embraced that message. And he came to faith in Christ. And that's why he can be called a brother. He's a brother not because he's of the human family. He's a brother because he has a relationship with Jesus Christ, and his father is God, which makes him a brother of the Apostle Paul. He's a brother in the faith. So Jesus said to him, you must be born again. And when he heard that message, he repented and he trusted in Christ. And that resulted in his entering into the family of God. He became a brother. It's like what Jesus said in Mark 3, verse 35, where he said, whoever does the will of God is my brother and my sister and my mother. So we become family. We are baptized by one spirit into one body. We become family and we have relationship. And that's why he could speak of him as his brother in the Lord. But he also refers to him as a faithful minister. 
He was filled with faith, faithful. He was filled with faith. He was trustworthy. He was a genuine servant of Jesus Christ. In 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 2, Paul said it like this. He said, the things that you've heard from me among many witnesses, commit these to faithful men who will be able to teach others also. So not only is he a brother in the Lord, but he's also faithful. He's somebody that Paul could trust, who could go with a message from Paul and come back with a response, and Paul could trust him. Somebody said he showed himself to be worthy of this calling by a faithful discharge of his ministry and by laboring fervently and pressing them forward that they might stand complete in all the will of God. So he speaks of him as a beloved brother. He speaks of him as a faithful minister, and he also speaks to him as a fellow servant. He didn't hold the same office. He wasn't an apostle, but he was entrusted with the same message, and he was a humble servant of the Lord. He understood that he was saved to serve, and he was to do so faithfully. And that qualified him. That qualified him to bring messages and to return with news. He was trustworthy. He was mature in the faith. And he was somebody that Paul could say, take this and tell them this and then come back with their response. And so Paul was there in prison. And Tychicus was to tell them news about Paul. These people were concerned for Paul. And so in verse 8, he said, I'm sending him to you for this very purpose that he may know your circumstances and comfort your hearts. So Tychicus is bringing news to them about Paul, but he also wants to hear about how they are. Listen, as a pastor, Paul would be concerned for them. In 1 Thessalonians 3, verse 5, Paul said to the church there, for this reason, when I could no longer endure it, I sent to know your faith, lest by some means the tempter had tempted you and our labor might be in vain. So Paul wanted to know how they were. Are you being steadfast? Are you being blessed? Do you have any needs? Are you preaching the gospel? Are you remaining faithful to Jesus? Are you loving one another? Are enemies of the cross entering in? Are they undermining your faith? Are you okay? That's the heart of a pastor. And so that's what he's doing. He also came to comfort their hearts with encouragement from the Lord. He was going to do that by revealing how powerfully Paul was being upheld in all his afflictions and how God had turned his imprisonment to the advancing of the gospel. What you have here is a picture of brotherhood. You have a picture of relationships, a, a picture of, of men who needed one another who confided in one another and cared about one another, who trusted one another, who loved one another. God knows we need that today. God knows we need that today. The Lord has been good to us. He's been good to me. You know, in the ministry, it's been said that sometimes that the minister is the loneliest person in the church, and in some ways that can be true. And so I need friends. And I need relationships. I need people who help to bear my burdens. I need that like you do. You know, when, when my father, when my father died, I, I can still remember uh, the sudden, suddenness of it and, and how difficult it was for me to, to grapple with that, to grasp the fact that he died. He died so suddenly, it was difficult. And I can still remember a phone call. I, I tease about my friendship with Raul Reese and all of you guys uh, are aware of Raw, probably all of you are. And, um, and I tease on occasion about him because I, I enjoy doing that. But I'll tell you this. I can remember how uh, when my father died, I, I just, it just hit me so hard. And my wife Marie walks into to, uh, where I was seated and she said, Raw's on the phone. And I remember taking the phone and just answering the phone and, and saying, Hi, Raw, how you doing? And he said, hi, David, how are you? And I just started sharing. I still remember saying, you know, my dad died. Raul didn't say a word. He just, just listened. And I needed that. I needed someone to just hear how I was feeling at that moment. And he provided that for me. I love the man very deeply. Uh, years ago, right around when my father died, I lost my memory. I was hospitalized, and it was pretty serious. 
and I'd lost my memory. And uh, Raul heard about it, and Raul calls me up, and he says, Dave, how you doing? I heard you lost your memory. And I said, yeah. He says, does that mean you, you forgot that you still owe me $500? Now, that's, a, <laughs> the, that's the jerk that he can be, too, you know, so. But I need that. I, I need friends. I need people that I can laugh with. I need people that, 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 that know me. I, I have friends in this church. Uh, I have one friend in this fellowship who has known me since I was 14 years old. I meet with him and two other friends that I've known, one since I was five and the other since I was 14. And I meet with them monthly. And we'll kind of laugh and remember things that we did in high school and, and tease each other. And I enjoy that. I need that. So do you. So do you. You need somebody in your life that, 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 that contributes to it, that encourages you, that, that, that loves you and that you love and, and you can enjoy your time with them. And there are plenty of opportunities, if you want, here in this fellowship to have that, to serve alongside of one another, to be involved in a study together, to go on retreats and things. There are plenty of opportunities if you desire them and you need them and they ought to be things that you, you take advantage of because it's a brotherhood. It's more than just a club. It's more than just arriving in the same location at the same time, listening to the same thing, and then leaving at the same time. It's much deeper than that, and that's why Paul could speak in the way that he did. He cared about these people. He wanted them to be walking together, to have relationship together, and to know what was going on. He, they wanted to know how he was, and he wants to know how they are, and that's how it works. He wanted to encourage them. He wanted them to know that he's okay, but he wanted to know that they were too. And so he moves on into verse 9, and he speaks of another one named Onesimus. He says, he's a faithful and beloved brother who is one of you. He was from Colossae. And they will make known to you all things which are happening here. So he speaks of Onesimus. The word Onesimus literally is translated profitable. And he's a faithful and beloved brother. And he says, he's one of you, he's from Colossae. He's a Colossian. This is the man who was mentioned in another letter, the letter of Philemon. And we know that, that Onesimus is a run, was a runaway slave. This is a runaway slave who was brought to faith in Christ by Paul. He had been saved under Paul's ministry, returned to Philemon as a believer, and had become very dear to the apostle Paul. And Philemon, in, in verses 10 through 13, Paul writes to, to, uh, to him and says, I appeal to you for my son Onesimus, whom I have begotten while in my chains, who once was unprofitable to you, but now is profitable to you and to me. I am sending him back. You, therefore, receive him, that is, my own heart, whom I wish to keep with me, that on your behalf he might minister to me in my chains for the gospel." So he speaks of Onesimus, a runaway slave who is, uh, whose name means profitable. And it's interesting that when you read this uh, in Philemon, he says he was once unprofitable, is now profitable. He was not living up to his name, but now he is. And I'm sending him back to you because he's profitable to me. And that shows us how God takes that which is unprofitable and makes it profitable. You may have had a reputation. There are people who knew you when you were younger, and they would say, he's no good, unprofitable. She's no good. She's unprofitable. That's what that means. To be unprofitable is to be no good. And, and, and they could say that of you. They could say they're no good. They're lazy. They don't work. They don't go to school. They're not faithful. They're a liar. They're a thief. They're a drunk. They're a druggie. They're violent. They could have said all kinds of things about you. But you know what God did? God grabbed hold of you. God changed you. God, by the power of the Holy Spirit and the direction of his word, changed you to become somebody unrecognizable to those who knew you best. Because God is a God who transforms the sinners into the likeness of his son. And you have become profitable even though at one time you were unprofitable. And that's how it works. And he can change you so much that those who knew you best don't recognize you anymore. My friend that I mentioned earlier, his name is Art. Art was in this church. He's here still. But Art was in this church for a year. For a year. And I would come out and teach. And he told his wife, I used to know a guy named David Rosales. That's not him. That couldn't be him. 
because we used to hang around together. And he knew me when I was young. And it took him a year. And his wife finally wrote and said, you know, my friend, Art, my, my, my husband, Art, knew somebody named David Rosales, went to high school. You, and she was asking, are you that man? And I wrote back and I said, yeah. And, and we connected that way. But that's how God can change you. It isn't just my age. It has something to do with it. But it's, the, it's my reputation. It's how I was transformed. I was once unprofitable. You were once unprofitable, but now you're profitable because God has a way of working in people's lives to take what you were, bury it, and bring up a new life, and it's called the new you. You have been born again, and that's how God works in our lives. And that's why we bless the Lord. And that's why as we look at him, we're seeing a man by the name of Onesimus, and he's described as faithful and beloved. He's one of you. And this is someone I can trust and, I'm, and, and, and he's going to be able to bring a report back to me. He goes on into verse 10 and says, Aristarchus, Aristarchus, my fellow prisoner, greets you with Mark, the cousin of Barnabas, about whom you received instructions. If he comes to you, welcome him. And so he moves on. Aristarchus, my fellow prisoner. Paul had mentioned Gentile believers, but now he's mentioning three Jewish believers. These three that we're going to be looking at were all Jewish who had come to faith in Jesus Christ as Messiah. He begins with Aristarchus. Aristarchus is a believer mentioned several times in the New Testament. He was a courageous believer. He was a native of Thessalonica, according to Acts 19 in chapter 20. When Paul was in Ephesus, a silversmith named Demetrius had stirred up a riot. A large group of idol worshipers had seized Aristarchus and a man named Gaius, but they let him go. Ultimately, he accompanied Paul to Jerusalem. He went with Paul to Rome. Notice how it says, though, in verse 10, he is a fellow prisoner. That could speak either in a physical sense or perhaps that he is spiritually in chains with him. It would seem that when Paul was in prison in Rome, Aristarchus remained with him. Now, according to tradition, he was martyred during the persecution of Nero. But Aristarchus, for us, is a model of commitment. He wasn't ashamed of identifying with the gospel, and he wasn't ashamed of identifying with the apostle Paul. There are a lot of Christians today who are ashamed of admitting they're Christians because the spirit of this age is so anti-Christ, they keep quiet. They don't say anything. It's not like we're supposed to go and pick fights spiritually, but they do hide that, that light under a basket. They don't want to be identified with the Nazarene. But the bottom line is Aristarchus wasn't that way. And he wasn't ashamed of Paul, the prisoner of the Lord. And he spent time with him and ministered to him and visited him. Visiting a, a prisoner could be dangerous. A prison visitor was no longer one of the anonymous crowds. And someone might associate the visitor with the alleged crimes of the accused. When early Christians obeyed their Lord and visited those who were in prison, they did more than perform an inconvenient act let down into the prison by rope. They left only at the pleasure of the guards. This is a man who was not ashamed of Paul, his chains or visiting or being identified with him. This is a man who was committed to Christ. He was a man who was a follower. And it's been said when Christ calls a man, he bids him come and die. Aristarchus was a genuine follower of the Lord and he took discipleship seriously. You see, we, when we really follow the Lord with our heart, we, we cease living for ourselves. We begin to seek first the kingdom of God. Somebody said every day, each of us invests our time, money, gifts, talents, energies, relationships, and resources in the pursuit of something. Is your life invested in pursuing life? Does it have a higher goal than your own personal wants and needs? Do you find it hard to say no to you? Do you find yourself struggling with irritation, impatience, and anger when others unwittingly get in the way of what you want? Are you still holding tightly onto your life as if it really did belong to you? It's been said, he is no fool who gives up what he cannot keep to gain that which he cannot lose. And Aristarchus understood this completely. So you have Aristarchus. Then you move on to Mark, 
Notice in verse 10, Mark the cousin of Barnabas. And he says about whom you received instructions. If he comes to you, welcome him. Mark was brought to faith through the ministry of the apostle Peter in 1 Peter 5.13. According to Acts 12 verse 12, the early church met in his mother Mary's house. Mark is an example of restoration. I want to share with you a little bit, little bit about him. Mark, as a young believer, went on a ministry journey with Paul and Barnabas. Acts 12.25 says, Barnabas and Saul returned from Jerusalem when they had fulfilled their ministry, and they also took with them John, whose surname was Mark. In Acts 13, verse 5, it said, when they arrived in Salamis, they preached the word of God in the synagogues of the Jews. They also had John, John Mark, as their assistant. Now it seems that Mark was not prepared for such a difficult way of life because while on an island called Paphos, a sorcerer named Alamus tried to stop the gospel. There was a Roman governor named Sergius Paulus and he had sent for Paul and Barnabas because he wanted to hear the message of the gospel. But the Bible says that Elymas, the sorcerer, withstood them, seeking to turn the proconsul away from the faith. And in Acts 13, verses 9 through 11, it says, Saul, who also is called Paul, filled with the Holy Spirit, looked intently at him and said, O oh, full of all deceit and all fraud, you son of the devil. Wasn't he nice? You enemy of all righteousness, will you not cease perverting the straight ways of the Lord? And now, indeed, the hand of the Lord is upon you. You shall be blind, not seeing the sun for a time. And immediately a dark mist fell on him, and he went around seeking someone to lead him by the hand. Well, after this had happened, Mark decided he'd had enough of ministry. Acts 13, 13 says, John departed and returned to Jerusalem. The reason is not stated. It could have been fatigue. It could have been fear. It could have been that he was homesick, but he deserted. And when he deserted the mission, Paul did not want to take him on another journey. In the book of Acts, again, in chapter 15, verses 36 through 39, it says this. After some days, Paul said to Barnabas, let us now go back and visit our brethren in every city where we have preached the word of the Lord and see how they are doing. Now, Barnabas was determined to take with them John called Mark. But Paul insisted that they should not take with them the one who had departed from them in Pamphylia and had not gone with them to the work. The contention became so sharp that they parted from one another. And so Barnabas took Mark and sailed to Cyprus. But Paul chose Silas and departed being commended by the brethren to the grace of God. And he went through Syria and Cilicia, strengthening the churches. Now, what a contrast. Paul was an apostle, a teacher, a preacher, a fearless evangelist. And in some ways, it seems he didn't seem to have the time for people who were not sold out. This is where people who are gifted like Barnabas come in. The name Barnabas means son of comfort. Barnabas had the spiritual gifts of exhort exhortation and mercy. And he was willing and able to take Mark under his spiritual wing and to nurture him. While Paul went about preaching and evangelizing, Barnabas gently encouraged Mark. And it would seem that under the care of Barnabas, Mark was brought to maturity. Because Paul is now able to say, when he comes to you, welcome him. So I want to make a point here. Application. Failure does not have to be forever. Thank God for Barnabas, and thank God for the Barnabases that we have in the body of Christ. When somebody repents and seeks forgiveness, God's response is immediate. The minute, the second, the instant you say, God, be merciful unto me, you are forgiven. Your fellowship with God is restored, and you can move forward with him. When it comes to ministers who have struggled in their faith, the restoration is a different process. In Mark's case, it would not seem that it was a sin issue that had led him to return home. He needed someone next to him to help him understand what it meant to serve the Lord. Barnabas obviously loved him, and Barnabas obviously helped him. And in 1 Peter chapter 4, verse 8, it says, Above all things, have fervent love for one another. Love will cover a multitude of sin. 
We need Barnabases in our life. Perhaps you're a Barnabas, and I thank God for you. We need Barnabases in our life. We need people who may understand the situation, may not even agree with it, but are able to comfort and encourage us so that we can find the right path and move along. There are some who know how to criticize, but not many know how to comfort. There are some who know how to tell you what you should be doing, but don't know how to help you to get to do those things that you should be doing. Sometimes we can look at people and know exactly what the answer is. But sometimes the answer in that situation isn't me telling you what to do. It's me listening to you as you tell me how you failed. So that I can listen to you as you share with me. And, and I can weep with you when I need to. I'll rejoice with you too. But weep with you when you need someone to weep with you. There are times that I have not needed a Bible answer. I've needed a Bible friend. I have needed somebody who's next to me who can say, listen, God's with you. It'll be okay. You're not a failure. You'll be all right. I've needed that. You've needed that. Forgive me. I get emotional because it's true. You want to do right, and sometimes you don't. And you know what you did wrong. I don't need a lecture at that moment. I need an armor on my shoulder. I need someone who says to me, you may not be strong, but I'll stand with you. And together, we're going to make it. Because my God is able to supply all that you need. You simply need to turn back to him. And instead of bringing that criticism, we bring that encouragement. We need Barnabases in our life. We need men and women who can actually share with us in our burden who can have compassion, feeling the same things, and empathy, understanding the pain. We need that. You see, Mark was a man who was, had great promise, but Mark was a young man who had little experience. Paul was a fiery evangelist. We got to reach the world for Jesus Christ. Barnabas was a man who understood that, but he also knew that broken vessels need healing. And sometimes when that vessel is broken, there needs to be some time for it to mend. A, a bone that breaks in your hand, your foot, your arm, you can't walk on it the way that you used to. It has to heal. It will heal, but it needs time. And in ministry, there are times when I have needed just to sit down. One of the biggest mistakes I have ever made in ministry was I didn't give myself a chance to mourn the death of my father. I didn't take time off. I just kept my hand on the plow. I kept working that field, and I wept, and I would weep in the pulpit because I didn't give myself any time to just deal with it. I never did. One of the biggest mistakes I ever made. I should have taken time off, but I told my wife, I'm going to keep my hand to the plow. I'm going to keep on serving God. God is my portion. He is my strength. At the same time, I failed to realize I was broken and I needed healing. And from there, I began to learn by going through that to give other people compassionate understanding when they're broken too. That's how I learned some of the ministry that I now have. That's how I was changed because this vessel was broken. And I needed people in my life who could say, it's okay, I'm with you. I'm praying for you, even though they didn't understand. And some of the things you've gone through, haven't you been grateful when you've had a Barnabas in your life? Somebody who's there with you, not judging you. God knows you're judging yourself already. But somebody who's there saying, you know what? I have great hope in the Lord, and I have hope for you. And I know God will do something in you. I know he will. He will. Let's hold on together. Thank God for the Barnabases in the family of Christ. We have so many who are armchair quarterbacks, so many who are watching the game from the comfort of their own home. They sit in their armchair, they turn on the TV, and then they yell because the coach of the team isn't doing a good job, and the wife gets to hear you saying, what an idiot, shouldn't have done this, he should have done that. But see, you're not, I'm not in that game. I'm not in that box there. I'm not there. 
seeing what's going on. I'm not here, the crowd, you know. I'm not, I'm not seeing what's going on on the field. I'm not seeing that. I'm just sitting in the comfort of my home and uh, have kind of a, a look from a camera angle. But that coach, that manager, is going through something entirely different. And the church is very similar to that because sometimes the pastor is the manager or the coach and he's going through things and he's trying to sort things out and be fair to everybody and do the right thing. And you got somebody, you ought to have been doing this. And why didn't you do that? You should have done this. He's just, let's go. We got to go someplace. And you don't understand that sometimes the best thing you could have done is just write a letter saying, I support you, I love you, may God give you wisdom as you go through this trial. Those are Barnabases. We don't have enough of those in the church today. We have people who are so quick to point out something wrong and so few to encourage people to do that which is right. And the Lord needs more Barnabases, I believe. I think there are some but I think the, the Lord would have more Barnabases to stand up and say, look it, I understand Paul's a man. He's out there doing God's work. That's his call. But you know what I'll do? I'll take you aside for a little while. I'll help you to heal. And you're going to be useful in the ministry later on. And that's what took place. His story didn't end there. Ultimately, Paul grew to have great regard for him. It's been said the last thing somebody says about you is the most important thing they ever say about you. And the last thing Paul ever said about Mark is found in 2 Timothy chapter 4, verse 11, where he said, Get Mark and bring him with you, for he is useful to me for ministry. Ultimately, Mark was used by the Lord to write the gospel of Mark. And then finally, in verse 11, we see Jesus who is called Justice. He says, these are my only fellow workers for the kingdom of God who are of the circumcision. They have proved to be a comfort to me. Now this man here, Jesus called Justice, is an unknown outside of this passage. He is one who is unknown to many, but he's known to the one who matters. The great majority of believers are not well known to others, but they're known to God. Think about it for a minute. If I say, name some prominent Christians, I don't know who you'd name, but I'll just go with the general one that always was one of the best known. Oh, Billy Graham. Or you may mention somebody like that. There aren't that many Billy Grahams, are there? There are not that many Chuck Smiths. There are not that many that, that are well known to everybody. And we're amongst those who are unknowns. We are unknowns. One of the worst things a, a Christian can do is seek to be known. You need to know that the only one who knows you, the one who knows you is the one that counts, and that's the Lord. You need to realize that you can be unknown, like Paul said. He said this, he said to the Corinthians, as unknown and yet well known. I'm unknown to many, but well known to him. And if we understand that, then that helps us in our pursuit of serving God. When we get caught up wanting our names to be known, to be notorious, for free people to be able to mention, oh yeah, I know him, oh I go to that church. And for pastors, it's one of those hazards you have to avoid. To be known. The only one that matters is the one who's going to call you by name. The one who's going to look at you and say ultimately, well done my good and my faithful servant. Enter into the joy. Come on in. This is a place prepared for you. That's what we need to know. And yet a lot of us are caught up wanting to be known. Listen, it doesn't matter if somebody doesn't know you as long as he knows you. If he knows you, that matters. If he knows you, serve him with all your heart. Because one day you're going to look at him and he'll look back at you. And he's going to say, welcome in. And you're never going to say, but, but nobody knew me. Doesn't matter. I know you. And so I look at this and I see this man, Jesus called Justice. He's only mentioned here in Scripture, but he's one of those many unknowns that was known by God. Keep that in mind. It keeps you humble. But he goes on and he finally says, these are my only fellow workers for the kingdom of God who are Jewish. These are the only Jews working alongside of me. Paul obviously felt abandoned by his Jewish brethren, and yet these have been of great comfort to me. They have proved to be a comfort to me. Thank God for those who have proven to be a great comfort to us. 
in closing, I've been asked, I've been in ministry for a long time, I've been asked, how do you remain faithful for so many years? I've been a Christian 40, 48 years. I've been in ministry for 45. Pastoring this church for 38. How have you remained faithful for so long? It's not me being faithful, it's he is faithful. He loves me. And when you're grateful to what God has done in your life, when you're thankful for those who have been of good influence in you, well, you just, you can just keep serving the Lord with joy because he's always faithful and he's never let me down. God has always been faithful. He is a faithful God. And though there are friends that have moved on and gone other places, God has always remained faithful right at the center. God has always been there. He always will be. And one of these days, and it's not that long from now, we all are going to have an opportunity to look him square in the face, if you will, to see him as he is and to say to him, thank you for your goodness to us. Thank you for your goodness to me. For you have been a blessing, God. You have been a blessing, God. And I love you, Lord, with all of my heart because that's what God has called us to do, is to love him. Why? Because he first loved you.